Hi all, uh, if you just joined, welcome to the Science Coalition's first comms workshop webinar, telling the story of basic research. This is Vanessa Bako from the Forbes State team. I'll be moderating our discussion today. Uh, in the interest of time, we won't do introductions for everyone on the call, but just so you're aware, in the room with me are also Jean Moran and Megan DiMuzio from Forbes State, uh, who work with me to support the Science Coalition on communications. Uh, over the next hour, we'll be hearing from coalition members on how their university communication teams tell the story of fundamental research to press and demonstrate the value of fundamental research to policymakers. Before we get started, I just wanted to go over a few things. Everyone should know that all participants on the call are muted upon entry. So for audio clarity, we just ask that you remain on mute till the end when we have our question and answer section. Uh, second, the webinar is going to be recorded, so again, no worries if you have to hop off part of the way through. We'll be distributing the recording in the coming days. And last, if you'd like to send over your questions during your presentation before we get to the Q&A, uh, feel free. You can do that by raising your hand. Um, that's in the participants window in the control panel. So once you select raise your hand, it'll alert me, the host, and I'll try you from there. Um, and the participants window is also where you can take yourself off mute when you're ready. So without further ado, I'll hand it off to my colleague, Jean, who can get us started. Hello, everybody. This is Jean Moran. Um, thank you all for joining us for the Science Coalition's first communications workshop, telling the story of fundamental scientific research. Um, as Vanessa explained over the next hour, uh, we will walk through what the Science Coalition is. Um, you'll hear from communications leaders from the University of Iowa and University of California, San Diego, San Diego, um, and what they consider best practices in the way of telling the story of fundamental scientific research. And then we'll open the floor for Q&A amongst all of you dialing in towards the end of the program. Okay, so as some of you may know, the Science Coalition is a nonprofit, nonpartisan organization based in Washington, D.C. Um, we're comprised of more than 50 of the nation's leading public and private research universities. And we serve solely as a public affairs organization. So we're dedicated to promoting the need for sustained federal investment in basic or fundamental scientific research. You'll see the list of our organization or our member institutions below. Um, so essentially we work to better communicate the impacts of the research breakthroughs that are made on our members' campuses so that audiences can better understand how crucial federal funding for these programs is. Um, through our efforts, we work to show policymakers and the public how fundamental research done on our university's campuses stimulates the economy, spurs innovation, drives America's global competitiveness. And so to do so, we conduct national and local media relations, including everything from earned and placed media, as well as content generation, including advertising, graphic content, um, to organic and promoted social media, and DC-based events with participants ranging from third-party partners to members of Congress. And so, um, the Science Coalition has set out to produce these workshop webinars as a way to share best practices amongst member institutions and their communications teams. We know that every single day, the communications teams of our member institutions are working to amplify press coverage on what's happening on their campuses. And research breakthroughs serve as a strong news item, but translating the real world impact of these breakthroughs for the press, general public, and sometimes even for federally elected lawmakers can be pretty difficult. So we wanted to facilitate a conversation between comms experts from our campuses that explores the challenges and best practices of better communicating the impacts of fundamental scientific research. And so, we have with us today our guest speakers, and I'll give this back over to Vanessa to walk through. So first up we have is Richard Lewis from University of Iowa. Uh, Richard is going to touch on uh, communicating the benefits of federal research to press. And then next up, we'll have Kim McDonald from University of California, San Diego. And Kim is going to address uh, demonstrating the value of fundamental research to policymakers. And again, we, we ask that you save your uh, questions till the end. Um, and without further ado, I'll hand it off to Richard from University of Iowa. I'm here, I'm trying to get my screen. Bear with me just a second. All right, 
Hi, everybody. I'm Richard Lewis at the University of Iowa. I'm delighted to be with you all today. You all are my peers, so it's a pleasure to speak with you all, and I have a feeling I might learn as much from you all as maybe you'll learn from me. And I want to thank you for taking the time to join Kim and I on this webinar and also the Science Coalition for staging it. My presentation will be in three parts. Firstly, how the media judge stories, including those involving basic research. Secondly, some tips for how best to approach and produce a basic research story that will interest the media. And thirdly, a uh, soup to nuts example of a basic research result that we turned into a story and gained some national media coverage for it. Well, yes, we know that the media love stories with great drama or tension. And some basic research stories may have those elements, but many don't. Thankfully, though, the media use more criteria than simply drama or tension when deciding whether to pursue a story. In fact, the media use many criteria to judge the newsworthiness of a story. I've just put a, a seven there. There actually are more, but these are, I would say, maybe some of the, the major ones. Some stories, basic research stories, may meet just one criterion. Others may meet more, but I would argue that it's important to keep these criteria in mind when thinking about how best to approach and produce a story when the media is your target audience. So let's look at the approach to uh, producing a story. Reporters, either at the local level or certainly at the national level, are besieged by story ideas. That puts a premium on having your story stand out. The first thing I think about when judging a basic research uh, result or story is finding a good hook. That can be a captivating headline. It can be an, an informative subheadline that complements that main headline. And it could also be the first sentence or two of the story that draw the reader, that is the media, in. Relevance is primarily about making sure the narrative meets at least one of the newsworthiness criteria that I mentioned or had in the preceding slide. Audience, at least for this presentation, is the media. Simplicity is about writing style and story structure, two concepts which we'll examine in more detail later. And we'll talk later also about visuals and why I think they are so important and perhaps even critically important. Okay. So I'd like to walk you through a soup to nuts example that involves the case of an odd salamander species. This was a peer reviewed research result and I'll talk a little bit about how we turned that research result into a story and then how we gained some national media coverage for it, including how we pitched some reporters and uh, how we chose those reporters that we pitched, who we pitched. All right. So this is the manuscript that came into my inbox or I found out about it and then drew it up and looked at it. So at the top, you can see is your, is your headline. You can see the authorship uh, right below it, some of whom are from Iowa, others are from uh, institutions out, uh, not at Iowa. You see the, the journal, uh, peer review journal name there. And then you see in, in the gray, if you will, uh, the paragraph that's the abstract. Uh, that is the author's synopsis of what their finding or their result is. Honestly, when I looked at this, I didn't understand a whole lot about it. It was very complex, somewhat obtuse, and it was certainly pretty new material to me. But there were a few terms that jumped out at me. One was unisexual, which kind of intrigued me in terms of what that meant and why that would be important for biology and nature. Then there was a phrase called biological, I'm sorry, driver of biological diversity. And when I thought about that phrase, it seemed to me to have maybe something to deal with the natural world and maybe something to give some insights into that. The third uh, phrase or concept that, that, that kind of jumped out at me was genome balance, which I really didn't know much about. Um, but the fact that there's a balance there of some sort connoted that it's more than one. And I was kind of curious about that. So what I did was I just took that and just con simply contacted the main researchers. And I asked a very simple question. I just asked them to explain in as simple as possible, in, in as simple language as possible, what they found and why the media and therefore the public would find it important. And I would urge that anyone who does this kind of work do that. 
uh, faculty, researchers, uh, whether they're undergraduates, graduate students, postdocs, um, uh, faculty, they, they actually enjoy the chance to step outside of their scientific um, clothes, if you will, and try to explain what their research means. And faculty in particular are teachers, so they're used to um, interacting with folks, students primarily, who may not know specifically about their work. So that's what I did. I contacted them and just asked them that simple question. What is this about? Why would the public and the media find it important? So that led to uh, a little more information that then I went and interviewed uh, the researchers to basically find out more and then to try to figure out what is it in that paper that I could tease out and make that a narrative, a story that would be of interest to a reporter. And this is uh, part, at least the first part, if you will, of the story that we ran on, on our news website called Iowa Now. In the next slides, I'll talk about the headline, the subheadline, and the opening sentences as the hook. Two paragraphs in the story that I call the relevance, and then also how we found that cute looking salamander that was our visual. When you combine all that, that essentially was our approach to interest the media. And that, that of course, was the primary audience that we sought to reach, at least with this particular um, research result. So let's look at the hook. My editors deliberately chose to use the word promiscuous. Now that's a pretty catchy word. Um, one could say it's a bit of a double-edged sword because it kind of wanders in the territory that maybe some institutions might be a little shy about. But I'd like to note a couple of things. One is it is faithful to the research. We did not exaggerate. And we also okayed that term with the researchers themselves. So knowing all that, we felt we were on pretty solid ground to use a word like that in our headline. With my editor, Trisha Brown's expert help, we massaged the first two sentences of the story to create what I'd like to think as a gentle entry into some heavy biology with the whole balancing genome concept. And if you remember, that was something I really didn't know much about, but it kind of jumped out at me a little bit. So we tried to get into that a little bit more, obviously, with the story. Uh, notice that we stayed away from any complex or jargon-filled words that you might have seen in the abstract. And we really aim to keep the narrative simple. In fact, if you look at the, was it the first sentence? Yep, the first sentence, we even used the word simple. So we kind of really drove that point home, hopefully, you know, pretty well. So here's uh, talking about the relevance now, uh, or you could call it the take home message as well. I always think of a paragraph or two in the story as needing to stand as my central thesis. Uh, in journalism, uh, we call that the nut graph. What, regardless of how you call it, it should convey the essence of the research in simple, easy to understand language. It should also answer the question that every journalist is taught to ask, whether that person asks it aloud or just has it in his or her head. And that is, why should I care? In this case, we try to answer that question. Why should you care, uh, Ms. or Mr. Journalist? Well, we are appealing to people's interest in the oddities or wonders of the natural world through this all-female lineage salamander that has found the recipe for six million years for evolutionary success. So let's talk about the visuals, which I had said earlier could very well be the most critical part of, tell, of, of being able to capture media attention for a basic research story. The fact of the matter is we live in a visual world now more than ever. And as a former print journalist, it kind of hurts me a little bit to say that, but it's absolutely true. And it's also arguably true that basic research can be very difficult to find good visuals. So I urge uh, folks to be creative. Ask, first of all, ask your researchers for any ideas that they may have. You'll be surprised how many graduate students are really good at being able to create illustrations, animations, and other things, or even just have ideas that could then pop up as a really compelling visual to help you sell your story. Obviously, talk to your photographers, your videographers, animators, illustrators, whom you may have on your staff or you may have partnerships with at your respective institution. In general, I would say a, vi a visual is better than none at all. In this case of that, the odd salamander species, we were a little fortunate. A co-author on the paper who was not at Iowa had taken photographs of the, 
of the salamander. And these turned out to be pretty glamorous shots that were integral to helping us sell the story. Not all have to be so fortunate. In the photo on the right, our staff photographer, Tim Schoen, took this photo with a researcher who reenacted an experiment into how the brain tries to stop an initiated action. So he basically had them recreate it and have someone stand in, and then he used some special photography mag ma uh, magic, if you will, wizardry, I guess, to kind of get that cool red light type of flaring there. The visual on the bottom um, was created by a student designer at Iowa who we asked to illustrate a relatively difficult concept, which was a potential new vaccine to combat dust mite allergies. So in these three examples, we used three separate strategies to get visuals that each help publicize the stories and the research. So once we had the story, or once I had the story, then it was time to try to interest some media. In this case, I, um, I, I do it in, in a few different ways. Uh, one is there's obviously your traditional email pitch, and I'm sure many of you are familiar with that. Uh, I also will text some reporters, only those, of course, with whom I have a very um, solid uh, and friendly relationship. Um, with those I don't know as well, I'll use social media platforms such as Twitter. And that's what I did in this case. I used that platform to pitch Rachel Feltman, who is a science editor at Popular Science. Now she had been someone I've been following for quite a while and I actually had been responding from time to time to some of her tweets about various issues. So maybe she had kind of remembered me when I pitched her, maybe she didn't, I honestly don't know. Um, but it certainly didn't hurt that I had at least at some point some kind of relationship with her, uh, perhaps. So in this case, that did work. She did respond, as you can see. So then I followed up with an email. And, and it was a very brief one. I didn't go into detail about the research for two reasons. One is because I'm sending her the study. It was attached. And secondly, because I sent her a link to the story um, that I already written about the research. Not that I expected her to use the story, but just to give her the context that could supplement the very brief pitch that I'd made to her. I also gave her the contact information to the researchers, as you can see. Now, I did that after checking with the researchers to make sure that's okay. I didn't want to surprise them and have them get a phone call out of the blue from, from Rachel. But at the same time, what I'd like to do is, is to try to make the pitch, make the connection, and then try to sort of you know, hopefully graciously step aside and let the reporter do her or his work. Um, but I definitely let the researchers know and I talked with them a little bit about how they should frame, uh, how they characterize the research, frame their message, so to speak. The good news is we got some coverage. Um, and uh, as you can see from these examples here, the examples on the left, that's popular science on the top left, it's IFL science on the bottom left, came from direct pitches. Uh, the uh, mention on the right, that's NPR Science Friday, uh, came from a guest appearance by Rachel Feltman on that program. So that was uh, clearly a nice spillover from our original pitch to her. One quick thing to add, I didn't pitch this, uh, the salamander story to local media. I just felt the subject matter was a little too esoteric to really interest uh, the local folks and certainly no offense to them whatsoever. Um, and in fact, um, I actually use it, uh, I actually have different stories that I'll pitch only to local media and not to national media. And I'd be happy to, to talk about that in the Q&A if time permits, or if you all would like to contact me outside of this webinar about that. In any event, what I did do in this case is I really honed in on just a dozen or basically at most a dozen reporters to pitch this story to. I really wanted to keep it targeted. Um, and, and only reporters that I had done some research on that I thought would be interested in this kind of, isn't nature wonderful, isn't this an odd species kind of story. Um, with other stories, I'll cast a wider net or sometimes even a, a more narrow net. But in this case, it was about a dozen reporters only. Thank you for your time. I'd be happy to answer any questions after Kim's presentation. Again, if time doesn't permit, you're welcome to contact me outside of the webinar and I'd be happy to answer any questions you may have. Again, thank you for your time and Kim, take it away. All right, thanks Richard. 
So thank you for having me. And uh, let me just start um, start off by uh, talking about uh, the the fact that um, we can't, as news professionals, depend on the news media, and we have the ability to actually connect directly with the public through multimedia and a lot of other kinds of tools that we have. So the first part I, I you know wanted to mention, and I'm on the left side of this picture, by the way. Um, and the picture is actually relevant. It's uh, Black's Beach, which happens to be the big surfing beach um, just down the hill from UC San Diego near the Scripps Institution of Oceanography. And I'll describe the person on the right um, in a minute. Uh, but what I wanted to say about uh, covering basic science is, is basic science is really very, very hard to publicize, especially by news release. Basic physics, chemistry, mathematics, and biology really don't have a lot of relevance to the ordinary person. So at my university, we have a medical school, we have the Scripps Institution of Oceanography, where at the med school, things have a clinical application at Scripps, you have climate change, the environment. There are a lot of things that have direct relevance to people's lives. Um, so what I've tried to do, well, what I'll, is, is to think of other ways to communicate um, what we do in basic science to the public, to policymakers, and to the news media. So just to backtrack a little bit, um, we all know about the problems that the news media have had in the last uh, 20 years or so. And uh, the newspaper weekday print circulation has steadily declined for the last 20 years or so. And as a, re as a result, there are fewer and fewer journalists at mainstream news organizations who cover science particularly the kind of fundamental science, as opposed to technology and health, performed at our research universities. So these um, statistics come from a recent report, Perceptions of Science in America, that I lifted. And I wanted to just uh, basically go over a few um, things that the report found in, in polls. Confidence and trust among the public in scientific institutions and science leaders has remained relatively high over the past 30 years. So a couple of years ago, 90% of Americans had either a great deal or only some confidence in the science community. And it's in line with the military and far, far above the press, Congress, banks, and financial institutions. So I'm having trouble advancing this. Let me, oh, here it is. All right. So. The, um, the brown line at the top is where the scientific community um, uh, lies in terms of the percentage of confidence that the public has in, in scientists and science leaders. And you'll see it's far above banks, far above uh, the press, far above Congress. These are some statements that um, the uh, poll found in the percentage of respondents who trust research scientists to, for example, tell the truth, report their findings accurately. So that's a great deal of trust. But the problem is that although the public trusts information from um, research institution, the average American really doesn't understand basic science. And this is borne out by the question that was um, asked uh, what is the very first thing that comes to mind when you hear the phrase scientific research? 52% of respondents had no response at all. 13% talked about, said uh, health medicine, medical research, 5% uh, disease cures, drugs treatments, and 4% white coats laboratories. Nowhere in this um, survey was the phrase, oh yeah, fundamental science, basic science that drives innovation. People really don't know that. So when we, we place a lot of emphasis in our research universities in publicizing um, our basic science news through news releases, and, and it's a good thing. I mean, it's, it's a good tool to use because it really represents a record of accomplishment when a scientist um, publishes an important paper in a journal. Um, they're frequently requested by researchers and administrators, too much, I think. Um, the journals and funding agencies actually find them very convenient and they help to publicize those uh, discoveries. 
it's a useful tool to use to send to uh, policymakers about major discoveries. And if you use Eureka Alert, you know that um, it'll go in the database of Eureka Alert so people can search it. It's shown on Google News, news websites, and it also provides a useful tip for a, a journalist. However, the problem with news releases is they're too often pushed by faculty and administrators. And I think people tend to um, write news releases just to keep people happy. I mean, we, you know, we do this all the time. If someone thinks a chair or a dean or a vice chancellor wants a news release, we'll, we'll do a news release. Oftentimes they're too technical, they're too long and detailed. It's a lot more information than really the public needs about that particular uh, discovery. And uh, as Richard uh, mentioned about the importance of good visuals, most of the news releases that are sent out really lack good visuals or videos, multimedia. So at my university, I would guess that we send out probably on average about 20 uh, research and news releases um, every day. And when you think about all of the universities that send um, uh, you know, their best news, for example, to a reporter, a national reporter, or even a local reporter. It's really too much for, for a journalist to, to look at all this. And a lot of them really don't look at them at all. The other thing is it's a really difficult medium to convey fundamental science discoveries and, thing, and feels like basic biology, chemistry, physics, and nanotechnology. So what I would like to, you to think about is to use ways um, other than uh, news releases to convey um, what you're doing at the university. Multimedia, social media, vi videos, internet tools have provided universities with the ability to inexpensively take their message directly to the public. So when I first came here, um, I worked at the Chronicle of Higher Education for about 20 years, and I got here at the university in 2000, and at that point, um, you know, videos were becoming more common on the internet. Um, I discovered we had a uh, TV station, UCSD TV, uh, that broadcasts locally onto, um, in a um, the cable uh, bandwidth network. Um, and so I, I went to the science producer and I, and I said, what if um, we, we started a, a, a couple of series of uh, lectures, um, basic science lectures, one for biology, which I called Science Matters, and the other we called uh, Atoms to X-rays. And I got, um, I got grants from local foundations um, as part of a, like a science education initiative to have faculty do a half an hour uh, middle school level lecture um, about uh, the implications of, of what they've found or just what's interesting about their particular uh, endeavor of study. And I wanted it to be very visual, and I also brought uh, middle school students into the uh, uh, lecture hall to, as we filmed it so that it would reinforce the idea that this was um, for the, uh, you know, the, the average person and not for the scientist. So we had, we had those um, two lectures running for about three years and developed a lot of good content from that. The other thing um, we've done at our campus is I was part of a group that um, got a grant from the Moore Foundation to help train researchers to, um, and faculty uh, especially, to um, explain and to communicate the research to the public. And we launched this program right after the March for Science. And um, there was just a huge outpouring of interest from researchers who wanted to, thought, you know, this is really important. What we're doing is really important with March. So what, what are the next steps? And so we engaged a lot of faculty uh, in doing that. So think about, you know, Facebook, Instagram, YouTube videos. Um, you can also supplement your news releases with simple text-based videos. There's a, if you go to a site called lumen5.com, you'll find that uh, you can actually, um, uh, load up a news release um, and um, the uh, website will actually find non-copyrighted photographs and videos and with keywords in your news release it'll um, 
basically develop a text-based video for you. And I'll show you an example of that at the end of this talk. The other thing you might want to think about, and, I, and I've, I'm going to show an example of how we did this, is showcase the technology or products developed from some of your campus-based basic research. So think about um, what makes your research unique or different. Is there a type of basic research project that showcases some of these attributes? Because that'll help you not only publicize the research and your researchers, but it'll help you market the campus. So one common thread for all of us um, on basic and on uh, research universities is that our discoveries provide innovation and social economic prosperity for our cities and, and uh, states. So at UC San Diego, um, what makes us unique is that our campus is on the ocean, where many of our students and faculty are surfers. We care for the environment as a result. Our history uh, since the inception of the university has been interdisciplinary research. So that we bring teams of researchers from different disciplines to work on common problems um, from chemistry, biology, engineering, and medical school. And unlike a lot of research institutions, we actually welcome undergraduate students in our research and innovation activities. In fact, the faculty find that it provides a more focused learning environment because the students are engaged in products where the, in projects where they're actually developing a product, not just a cookbook uh, recipe or lab exercise. So one of the things we have on our campus is a group of uh, biologists and chemists who are working together on developing ways to enhance the yield of oil um, in algae to develop uh, algae biofuels for uh, transportation. And um, what uh, the, the lead research uh, researcher, Steve Mayfield, came to me about uh, two and a half years ago and said, hey, Kim, what if, um, he, he's a surfer, and he said, uh, I actually met a guy in Oceanside who um, developed surfboard uh, blanks, and we could maybe do a test run of an, of an algae surfboard blank. So um, surfboard blanks are made of uh, petroleum, and his idea was to find a way to chemically turn the uh, algae oil into a hard foam that would replace the petroleum blank. And so, um, he was successful. We actually went down uh, and developed uh, the first uh, surfboard blank. I did a story about this uh, uh, two and a half years ago. And um, actually, um, to, to talk about uh, engaging policymakers, uh, Marty Gilchrist, who is the surfboard blank developer, he's on the left. Uh, on, to, right, to the right of him is our mayor, Mayor Kevin Faulkner. And we presented him um, on stage with the person on the right uh, of him is uh, Rob Machado. He's a professional surfer. And so we pre presented him with the first uh, algae surfboard. So if you go into uh, Mayor Faulkner's office in San Diego, you'll see it right behind his desk. So that's a really great way to you know, engage um, your local policymakers or representatives in um, the things that you're doing on campus. So back to um, the guy who's on my right, uh, that's Greg Long. He's the, um, he lives in San Clemente, which is about an hour just drive uh, from us um, north. And uh, he is the uh, winner of the uh, triple crown of big wave surfing. And might not mean a lot to you, but in uh, San Diego, it's a big deal. And um, actually the funny story about this is uh, we brought him to the beach and he was the first um, surfer to surf the algae surfboard because we had, I got a call from uh, CBS News, um, the national news, morning news, that uh, they wanted to do a story about the algae surfboard. So we called up uh, Greg and he came down and uh, I had two uh, four wheel vehicles on the beach. And I know a, uh, a number of the lifeguards, but there are two lifeguards that I didn't know came up in a truck and said, you know, you're, you're gonna have to get these, do you have a permit? And I said, no, I, you know, we don't have a filming permit, but I'm from the chancellor's office and uh, you know, we're filming uh, our, our new algae surfboard. And the guy said, uh, I don't care. You're gonna have to get the vehicles out of the way. And uh, 
And I said, well, you see that guy down the, down the beach? That's a uh, great lawn. And they took a look down the beach and uh, one guy said, hey, that is great lawn. And all of a sudden the, uh, uh, the tone of the conversation changed. You guys are all right. You can stay on the beach. If you need lunch, we'll bring lunch later on. So great lawn's a big deal on our, and, uh, on, uh, you know, in, in San Diego. And one of the things that um, you might want to try to do is um, engage different audiences because when we uh, um, when we had them surf the first uh, uh, the uh, algae surfboard for the first time, we actually sent it out on Twitter with uh, Greg Long's uh, uh, tag, and um, we engaged a lot of people we might not normally reach uh, through our uh, you know news sites and social media. So I want to show you um, an example of a video that we developed, and this was done in about three days, just to showcase um, the uh, LG surfboard. So I provided that um, that video uh, to um, uh, to a number of people, uh, the B roll actually, and um, uh, news organizations, other types of organizations, and um, let me just let's try to escape or move forward on this. And um, so I provided that video to um, the B roll to a lot of other um, groups and um, since in the last two years there have been a plethora of videos about uh, the algae support at UC San Diego that um, that I really was not aware of until um, the researchers let me know about it and they said um, it's amazing I mean they're, they're getting like two um, three three two or three million views on some of these and um, it was it's just a it was a simple video to make um, it took, um, as I mentioned, uh, just three days, and um, the reach was incredible. Um, so the, the second um, idea that this particular researcher had was, um, and this is a picture that he took in the Maldives uh, last year, was um, the number one source of litter on beaches is actually flip-flops. And he said, what if we actually um, 
developed a flip-flop from the algae oil, a sustainable flip-flop, which, which could be uh, biodegradable. So I actually did a story about uh, this work that was done over the summer by uh, a group of students. And this is, um, it's called a flip-flop revolution, but it's taking the idea of developing a hard foam and chemically altering it a bit to develop a soft foam that could be used uh, as a sole and a shoe. And this is uh, Steve Mayfield with the first generation of the, uh, the Triton uh, algae flip-flop. The Triton is our mascot, the Neptune mascot. So you see that on the bottom of the flip-flop. And it was um, designed basically uh, by students who tested various um, samples in an oven. And they poured this, um, this liquid that you see is, is basically the algae oil, the polyol, and they baked it. And they, um, it was just an empirical um, project to find out um, how they could make a flexible sole, which, which um, you know, what kind of recipe, chemical recipe would, would yield that. And so we did, did another video, and this was last uh, year, on the algae flip-flops, and I'll show that to you. So what we thought was, well, okay, if we can make rigid foams from our algae polyols, then we could make soft foams from our algae polyols. And we set about to do that and to make shoes. And what we elected to make was a flip-flop. There are about three billion of these made every year. Number one shoe in India, number one shoe in China, this is the number one shoe in Africa. And in fact, a lot of the pollution that comes in our ocean are things just like this that get discarded flow down the rivers and end up in the ocean where they become part of the environment, right? So if we can make one that's sustainable and biodegradable, we have a chance to impact not only San Diego and the surface we live here, but every beach community, in fact, the entire planet that we all have. So what is different about this shoe? Carbon that's in this shoe was captured from the atmosphere, not pulled from underground. Two, at the end of this life, our plan is to throw this into a compost pile and it will be eaten by organisms. So specifically with this project, what we decided from the beginning was, yeah, we're going to make the discoveries in chemistry and biology so we can make a renewable shoe. And then we're going to actually make a prototype shoe, and we're going to get that into the market. How do you do that? Well, you do that by making a startup company. So we started a company called Algenesis Materials. And what their job is to do is to take our invention and our prototype shoe and actually turn it into a commercial shoe into a product that could be sold. Our plan is that within the next year, you will be able to go to the store and buy an algenesis shoe that is sustainable, biodegradable, and that was invented by students at UC San Diego. So the interesting thing that you might um, find is that the driving force um, for that um, that uh, discovery and, and my, my uh, the publicity efforts is, was not um, through a news release, but it was through a story that I did for the campus publication, which is called uh, This Week at UC San Diego, and this particular video, which um, got huge number of views um, once again. <clears throat> so the last thing I wanted to show you is that um, yesterday, um, and then this was a development, we're, we're part of the University of California campus, um, uh, we're part of the University of California system, and uh, the, there was interest on in the part of the, the uh, president's office to, with the algae um, surfboard and the flip-flops to develop a, um, a Facebook um, slash uh, Twitter Instagram video. And I just wanted to show you what this looked like. It was actually released yesterday. Um, so let me just show it to you. Might have to escape out of this, and come back in. So it's a simple video. It's a video that's very much like uh, what I was describing to you, the Lumen 5 type video. It has text, but it weaves in, um, uh, I messed it up again. It weaves in, um, some of the uh, photographs uh, and um, sound and, and B-roll. Our plan is that within the next year, you will be able to go to the store and buy an algenesis shoe 
the sustainable biodegradable and that was invented when the students were pushing sand. When you drill a hole in the ground and pull oil out of the ground, you are pulling out algae oil. That's all that stuff is. Fossilized. 300 to 400 million years old. It doesn't come from melted dinosaurs or something else. It's all controlled in this algae oil. So when we produce algae oil in our little ponds right here, we're actually not doing anything different than what's underground. Surfers, maybe more than any other sport, you are totally connected and immersed in the environment. Surfers pride themselves on, you know, taking care of the ocean, and you can still enjoy the ocean by doing it in an environmentally friendly and sustainable way. So people are, um, you know, just to reemphasize, people are more interested in um, the visual aspects and not a lot of words. So we, um, those types of um, multimedia that are very, very simple are the ones that get a lot of traction. And this last slide, I just wanted to show you that it helps, I think, this, this whole idea about um, us being environmental, being innovative, um, that we're um, you know, on the beach, that we're do, doing these kinds of things helps in some of our rankings, um, even with Surfer Magazine. <laughs> so that's it. If, uh, I wanted to leave time for questions. Thanks, Kim, and thank you, Richard, as well. Both of those presentations really showed strong examples of basic research on campus and how those examples were then translated to press and to the policymakers. We're really looking for those examples when they're justifying their support for federal funding. That was really great, so thank you. Um, as Kim mentioned, we would love to take some questions. We have about 10 minutes. If you would like to comment or ask a question, please feel free to raise your hand or chat me privately. I think I saw one question already from Betsy Boyd at University of Oregon. Betsy wanted to touch on the practice of, of attributing uh, these examples to federal agencies and why that's so important. Yeah, hi, this, this is Richard Iowa. I can, I can maybe take that just uh, at least partially and Kim, feel free to add. Um, if you're talking about uh, working with federal agencies, that is absolutely critical. I look at that as another audience. So as Kim talked about, Certainly what we do, uh, the media is one audience, and I would argue to time immemorial that is a critical audience. It validates the research and the results and, and, every, and a lot of things that take place at colleges and universities. But at the same time, it's not the only audience. And uh, funding agencies are, are increasingly important because we know that the, the funding is more challenging than ever for researchers at our respective campuses. Um, and so having those partnerships are, are, are increasingly important and what we've been trying to do here is make sure that we are sharing our results and even before the results even our current research uh, with the appropriate federal agencies and in fact um, we have met in person with communications officers at federal funding agencies to introduce ourselves that is at Iowa um, the storytellers if you will my storytelling team um, and what and, and basically just say what can we do to highlight the research that you all have funded at our university on your communications channels and as Kim kind of talked about that can be a whole host of products and in fact we're working on one right now where we're show, showcasing an electron microprobe which which believe me is not the most visually exciting um, app, uh, thing to show but what we've done is we we're making a very sh uh, we're making a raw video that shows a student using it, and ex and then with some text that explains why she's using it, um, and then we sent that to this funding agency, and that agency is then going to turn it into a product that it will then communicate uh, on its behalf and by extension on our behalf. So that's an example of where we're trying to reach uh, a funding agency and its audience um, in in maybe a different way. Does that answer your question a little bit, I hope? Yeah, and I can chime in that um, in the uh, surfboard, for example, you saw there was a logo from the Department of Energy. 
Well, the Department of Energy actually didn't um, fund the development of the algae surfboard, but they were a long time um, funder of uh, Steve Mayfield's research to develop algae biofuels. So um, we actually put a logo for the Department of Energy. Um, Steve gave them, uh, shipped a board to them that I think is in the US Department of Energy. But, and they helped us uh, to get um, the uh, publicity out um, initially about the algae surfboard internationally. And um, one of the other things too is we worked with um, uh, local admin, uh, assembly member, state assembly member Jackie Irwin, who provided seed money for uh, in a, the innovation uh, development for the um, flip flops. Um, and it's actually uh, developed into a, a company called Algenesis. But we brought her to campus um, about a month ago. And um, when uh, we had a, a number of uh, faculty and students that uh, talked about how they used the state money to uh, develop uh, new innovations. And when it came to the, the uh, algae surfboard and the flip-flops, everybody knew about that. And in fact, uh, Christine Gilbronson, who is um, the vice president in the University of California's Office for Innovation said that um, she received the surfboard from uh, Steve Mayfield that is in her office. And she said, whenever anybody comes to her office, they always ask, it's a good, good uh, conversation starter, do you surf? And she says, no, but this is one of the innovations that came out of the University of California. So let me tell you about this and about all the other innovations. So, you know, it's a really great way to, to showcase the basic research through the things that, um, that people can see and touch and feel. Thanks, Richard. Thanks, Kim. It looks like we have another question from Lisa Hayward. And she asked if either of you could go into a little more detail on how you plan to coordinate communication among scientists, members of the media, agency communicators, et cetera. In other words, how do you stitch together all those constituencies? I mean, I guess I guess I would say that um, it's, it's deciding on uh, which audience you're trying to reach with whatever um, story or idea that you have. Um, and not every, producing, a, and Kim had some different examples and we have some as well. Um, there are different ways to, um, to tell a story that might be more appropriate for a specific audience. Um, the media might take it in a more traditional way um, with a story uh, like a quote-unquote news release, even though I agree with Kim that we're, we're going way beyond news releases at this point. Uh, social media platforms may be another way to reach particular um, audiences. Um, videos obviously are incredibly important, um, and that's another way. It's, there, it, you, could, could, you could look at different approaches to reach whichever audience you think is uh, is the one that you're trying to target and maybe even have different products to reach uh, separate audiences, um, which of course might mean more work and, and I get that. Um, and that's where I think uh, the idea of being selective is really important. And I think that's especially important with basic research. It's hard to make a story out of everything. And um, as Kim mentioned, and I think I might've mentioned as well, reporters certainly, at least the media, but other constituencies as well, they're just besieged by stuff that's coming out of research institutions. So at least we try to be really choosy about what we take on, if you will, and then how do we do it and try to really be thoughtful about what products we're creating for which audiences. As for funding agencies, I think really it's as simple as just finding out who are the professionals, the communications professionals at whichever funding agency you're, you're interested in and getting in touch with them. Um, they are trying to um, communicate the value of that agency's research just as diligently as we are at the college and university level. And trust me, they will, they will be overjoyed to know that there are maybe some, some things or some, some uh, stories or whatever it may be that they can actually piggyback on to help uh, showcase the value of their research. Thank you. It looks like we have another question from Mary Martale. Uh, she asked, when you are pitching stories to local media, do you tend to blast them to a local media list 
or are you providing um, all releases to local media? Uh, I'll, I'll try that one and Kim, feel free to, to add on if you'd like. Um, right. that's, a great, that's a great question. I'm glad someone asked it because um, I really do believe that there's a distinction there. Um, and I'll try to give a good example and I'll weave it in in terms of how specifically I did it uh, as briefly as I can because I know we're bumping up against the hour here. Um, last week, uh, I, uh, and actually this week, but I'll just talk about last week, I, I pitched um, to local media uh, a scientist who is a co-investigator. That means he's one of the scientists involved in a, a NASA mission that's called the Parker Solar Probe. Basically, that's a, a mission in which a, a spacecraft will go closest to the sun of, of any previously human-made object. And the idea is to uh, study something called the solar wind, which I won't bore you all with the details. In any event, he's not a principal investigator. Um, he is one of many scientists who are involved. However, he is uh, in, intimately involved with one of the four instrument suites aboard that spacecraft. So if, if, he, was, if he were just kind of tangentially involved, I don't even know if I would even try to leverage that. But since he was in, very much involved, intimately involved with one of the instruments, uh, I pitched him to local media. And, and I did that um, not as a blast. I never do a blast. I don't, I don't believe in that. And also, I think that that's something where if you make a mistake, it can be readily apparent to everybody. So I try it. I personalize them. However, I keep the, um, the gist of my pitch pretty much the same. Um, so I just personalize it in terms of putting that person's first name, if you will, um, and, and, and sending it that way. Um, if that makes sense. So, uh, you know, I'm sending separate emails, if you will, or, or a separate email to each reporter. Um, but at the same time, it, it's a really a very little added time for me to do that. Um, but it makes it, I think, uh, a little more personal than simply send, sending out a blast. Um, and uh, I, I also, um, with TVs, I don't hesitate to also follow up and send it to the newsroom account. So what I'll do is I'll find out who the assignment editor is, send it to that person, send it to, if there's a reporter who's in the, that particular market, which for us is Iowa City, I'll send it to her or him. And then I'll also kind of, uh, and I'll also backstop myself and send it to the newsroom. And I've never ever had anybody, uh, you know, anybody question that or say, why are you sending it to the newsroom? In fact, people do appreciate that because you never know who might pick up on something. One, two is, um, Reporters, uh, you know, journal, uh, reporters, whether in broadcast or print, they're in one day and they're finding another job another day. And nothing against the medium. Trust me, I, I love, I love the, uh, the medium. Um, but that's a, that's a fact. And you just have to be um, kind of adept at that. Um, and then, of course, I, I make sure that uh, I follow up as quickly as I can if they do have interest. And just to quickly add on to that, I also, and this is really important. Uh, because I've fallen into this trap before. I make sure that whoever, uh, whatever, I'm, if I'm pitching somebody, in this case, that particular scientist involved with that NASA mission, I find out beforehand, when are you around and when can you be available to respond to media inquiries? And I cannot stress how important that is because the last thing you want is to pitch, make a great pitch and have people interested and then find out that your faculty person is not available for you know, a several hour stretch on a given day, or even even worse, it's out of the country for three weeks or something like that. So just make sure you, you, you do, just make sure you check and make sure that person is available and is willing to speak to the media before you pitch that person out or whatever the story might be. Thanks, Richard. So we are past three o'clock um, in the interest of time, we're gonna go ahead and stop building questions, but if you have anything additional you'd like to ask either of the presenters, please feel free to contact the Forbes State team and we will connect you with either Richard or Kim. Just wanted to say thank you again to both of our presenters. Uh, thank you to everyone for attending today. We hope the discussion was insightful and we did want to make a plug for our next webinar, which will be on uh, Thursday, September 27th at the same time. So we hope to hear from you then. Thanks everyone.